John Foy once told the story of his childhood. He was born into a poor family, didn't have many relatives. A lot of them had died in a plague years before. He was orphaned at the age of eleven. He was sent off to live in a monastery. That's what they called a dekwat. The, one of the boys that just hung around the monastery helped fix rice for the monks and run errands for the monks. Had a little bit of an education, but not much. And as he got into his teens, he began to realize that his life didn't look all that promising. Didn't have any connections, didn't have much of an education. And so he looked at the drama. He said, this is the only way my life is going to have any meaning. It's going to go anywhere at all. As he said, I must not have much merit, so I've got to make some merit. And that was his original impulse to practice the Dharma, realizing on the one hand that he didn't have much to come from, but what he did have to come from was enough to practice the Dharma, and that this was his hope, that he could make something of himself through the practice. This is a common theme with a lot of Ajahn Man students. They came from peasant families, poor families, way up in the northeast mainly. And the basic message of Thai society was that poor people just didn't have anywhere to go. They were going to stay poor. And at the same time, there was a certain amount of pride in Bangkok that if anybody was going to understand the Dharma, it was the scholars in Bangkok. People had the background where they could read and think philosophical thoughts. And although it was possible for people to come from the countryside areas into Bangkok to learn, it was the, it was the scholars who were considered the ones who had kind of a monopoly on the Dharma. And so when John Mun was teaching, he found he had to deal with a lot of the sense that many people felt, well, I just don't have the merit in order to do anything, get anywhere in the practice. So he kept reminding his students, that you have everything you need. You've got a human body. You've got a human mind. You've got a breath. You've got your awareness. You've got some mindfulness, some alertness. These are all the things you need. And so a lot of his Dharma talks focused on, one, the fact that people were suffering, but two, that they had the, the resources, that if they worked at them, could take them out of suffering. That's the important point, if you work on them. You have to have a strong sense that where you are is suffering, but it is possible through your efforts to get beyond that suffering. This is what motivated Ajahn Fuang. Why he's willing to put in long hours in the practice, put up with a lot of hardships. Because that was the only way that progress was going to be made. We come to the West, and the problem is a little bit different. Most people coming to Buddhism come from comfortable backgrounds, good amount of education. But their sense of low self-esteem comes more from psychological issues. And some of them would like to hear that they really doesn't, you don't have to do much, just learn how to accept yourself as you are, and that's all, that, all you have to do, and that's what the Dharma is all about. But it leaves them where they are. The whole point of the Dharma is that it takes you to some place where you haven't been. As the Buddha says, you come to realize the as yet unrealized, to attain the as yet unattained, to know the as yet unknown, to find a true end of suffering. So there's a lot of work involved. It's not going to be hard all the time, but there are times when you really do have to go against 
what you'd like to do or what your comfort zone is. And it's this willingness to push yourself beyond your comfort zone. That's what's going to make all the difference. But at the same time realizing you have what it takes. Many times we keep ourselves back or hold ourselves back because we have a very limited notion of what we're capable of. And this is where low self-esteem can be debilitating, or a sense of shame can be debilitating. But as with so many other things, there's a skillful sense of shame and an unskillful sense of shame. The unskillful sense of shame is what keeps you where you are, with the idea that I can't get any better than I am, I'm pretty hopeless. That kind of shame the Buddha never encouraged. What he does encourage is your willingness to look at what you've been doing and to see where it's been unskillful. You are passing judgment, but you're passing judgment on your actions, not on yourself. And your intentions in the past may have been unskillful, or the actions may have been unskillful, but you're not stuck there. Just because you've had unskillful intentions doesn't mean that you're always going to have unskillful intentions. You can change your mind. You can change your habits. And the healthy sense of shame comes in here and says, okay, what I did in the past is nothing to be proud of. But I don't have to repeat that mistake. This is what your powers of judgment are good for. We tend to think of judgment as what a judge does in a courtroom, passes a final verdict on somebody, either lets them free or sends them off to jail. The Buddha here, though, is not talking about final judgment of that sort. It's more like judging a work in progress. How is it going? What can be changed? Or is it not going well? If it's not going well, what can I do to improve it? That kind of judgment is healthy. It's necessary. Because people without any sense of shame, people with no sense of judgment, are dangerous to themselves and the people around them. So what you need is practice in learning how to use your sense of shame in a skillful way, use your sense of judgment in a skillful way. And to be willing to push yourself beyond your comfort level. To find that you do have resources that you haven't tapped. Because we all have the potential for awakening. The qualities that the Buddha dis developed on the night of his awakening, or leading up to his awakening, are qualities that we all have in a potential form. Mindfulness, alertness, ardency, resolution. These things can be developed. And if we think that we're here just to accept the way we are, we're not accepting the fact that we could develop these things. So again, acceptance is something you have to learn to do in a skillful way. Accepting just where you are and thinking that, oh, that's all I have to do, I'm perfectly fine as I am. And again, dooms you to a really miserable life. Accepting where you are as a starting point. It's Realizing that you also have these potential qualities. Accepting that fact, too. That's a skillful use of acceptance. We're often taught mindfulness with the idea that simply noting what's already there and not doing anything about it, just learning how to be non-reactive, which assumes that our reactivity is what's causing us to suffer. Sometimes it's even presented that mindfulness is something that's totally without any kind of ideological background or ideological bias or agenda. But the way it's taught has an agenda, has an understanding, that where you are right now is something you're stuck with, and you're not responsible for having shaped it. Or if you are responsible, it's all something in the past, and all you can do in the present moment is accept, accept, accept. But that's not the understanding that the Buddha had when he taught mindfulness. He said, part of what you're experiencing now comes from the past, but you also have choices you're making in the present that are actually shaping the way you experience the present. 
the way you label things, the way you think about things. All of the aggregates that go into your sense of the present moment have an element of present intention in them. And that can be trained, that can be changed. So when we're mindful about things, it's not that we're simply noticing what's already there as a total given. But we notice, okay, what are we doing right now? Now what can be changed? And the different teachings on mindfulness give us a framework, either in terms of the body or our feelings, mind states, or mental qualities. As to what has to be accepted and what has to be changed, or can be changed, and how to go about changing it. So again, we're not passing final judgment on the present moment. We're looking at it as a work in progress, because it leads to the next moment, and then there's the next moment. And each moment there's an element of intention, skillful or unskillful. You've got to learn how to figure out which is which. And once you see clearly which is which, then the duties are pretty clearly laid out. If it's something unskillful, you want to learn how to abandon it, which requires understanding where it comes from. So you can undercut it by undercutting the cause. If it's something skillful, you want to maintain it, let it grow. And again, that requires understanding where it came from, so you can foster the skillful causes. So what we're watching here as we meditate is a work in progress. And it's not just watching, we're participating in the work. So the judgment we use here is the judgment, say, of a carpenter working on a piece of furniture. And as he planes the wood or polishes the wood, he has to keep watching. How is it going? Am I putting too much pressure, too little pressure? What needs to be redone? What has to be thrown out and started all over again? What can be salvaged? That's a skillful use of judgment. Because the carpenter would be ashamed to put out a sloppy piece of workmanship. He's got his reputation to maintain. He's got his self-esteem to maintain. So think of yourself as a craftsman and learn to develop the sense of shame, self-esteem, judgment, acceptance, and non-acceptance what things are skillful to accept, when things are not skillful to accept. So that you can develop master in what you're doing. <laughs>